Hello and welcome to Scott Rock, where your hosts from Climb Scotland, Robert McKenzie, and me, Cal McBain, catch up with climbers every two weeks who have different epic tales to tell us. We hope you enjoy the show. And remember, when you're out climbing, be safe and do your buddy checks. Hello and welcome back to Scott Rock. You are here with Robert and today is an epic one. Uh, We hope you've been managing to get out climbing, being safe, taking all your litter home and most importantly when you're out there doing your buddy checks. Uh, Now is not time to be making mistakes. Uh, This week on the podcast I had the honour of sitting down with one of Scotland's greatest mountaineers and famous polar explorers. Mrs. Myrtle Simpson. Working in Fort William and climbing in in the Scottish mountains with Scottish mountaineering legends like Hamish McInnes, McTie, Ian Sykes. Uh, She has been on expeditions across the world doing first ascents of massive, massive peaks. Uh, And then she went on to be the first woman to cross over Greenland unsupported. And an attempt to be the first people to reach the North Pole. She is a true legend. So I was super excited to be invited into Myrtle's lovely home to do this interview. And you know the old saying, never meet your heroes? Well, it's not true. Myrtle is one of the loveliest people I've ever met. We had an epic chat for hours. We looked at loads of photos. She told me loads of stories. She even made me lunch and tea. Hell, that's a bottle of wine away from a date. It was also her 90th birthday the day before we did this. So from all of our listeners here on Scott Rock, happy birthday, Merle. I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, If you guys could all help me out in sending happy birthday messages to Merle, you can leave us comments, send us an email, I will forward them on. Uh, So I am super thankful to Myrtle for sitting down with me. I've split this into two parts because we totally lost track of time. Uh, so get a cup of tea, sit back and enjoy a wandering stroll down memory lane with Myrtle Simpson. Supposed to be, or... You are supposed to be you. <laughs> just, just be you. But I mean... This is presumably people are listening to this thing. Yes. They're really hard faced climbers. They won't have, won't bother about anyone else's. Well, hopefully, hopefully with, with this podcast, we've hoped that we're going to get all the hardcore climbers kind of engaging in it. Uh, hence why we've interviewed Mick Ty, yourself, Mike Pescod. Uh, but we really want to get the young kids to be able to listen to this, so that they can get a bit of inspiration from from, from you guys. Um, So yeah, we're going for the full mix of of (laughs) listeners here. I don't know how successful we're being, but we're aiming for the full mix. Um, But yeah, just a chilled out conversation like we've been doing already is is really all all I'm looking for. Um, Want more tea? uh, Yeah, I'd love a bit more tea. You have to pour... Be really I don't want to chuck it up because it's 200 years old. Do you want more milk or not? Uh, No, 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 that should be fine. So yeah, I, just, you know, well, yeah. I don't know. I'll do well, I've, you want. I've got a lot of questions here. Some of them touch on some of the stuff that was in the video in, in Fort William, uh, in the Bump film. Uh, just because I, I would be, I'd be upset if I didn't ask some of those questions and hear some of those stories again first half because they were <laughs> but amazing. But look, I'll tell you something not to do. I was furious. It was somebody picked up the film. It, it, I think it was uh, must have been a newspaper or something. I'm not quite sure how it got picked up. Anyway, would I do a chit-chat yeah. with them? So I said, all right, all right. And the guy said, the first thing I want to ask you is, you know, in, oh, it was Ameri- Ameri- America, it must have been from the New York thing or something. Yeah. Anyway, we're very interested in Europe, you see. What's all this about in Scotland, or Britain, I think he said, that yeah. all you're interested in, here's this deadly virus, and all you talk about is loo paper. <laughs> And I thought, hey, look, what an insult. <laughs> and I couldn't think of anything to say. I didn't want to say, well, we never used... No, we didn't take it to the... Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. What, you know, and I Who thought, phones honestly, you up and asks about toilet what, roll? Particularly, you know, when the whole thing in it was the New York yeah. showing of the film. You know, it was terrific big time. So I was a bit chuffed to be... And then 
I thought, mm, right, you know, uh, who are these? <laughs> brilliant. And, and also, of course, I felt such an idiot because I couldn't think of anything clever to say about it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I, I mean, should we check? Have you got enough blue roll here? You all good? Do you need me to pop out and get some more? I don't think anybody in the country needs any more toilet roll after all this. Set for life. Well, I haven't been into a shop myself. And since Lindsay came here, Lindsay's been doing, doing all the shopping. But we had an organisation within King Craig. It was yeah. called the Geriatrics Grub. And somebody was actually in the SMC. Um, he fixed it all up, but it's actually the Italian who runs our little calf, which right. just reopened, who actually, you know, rings, rings everybody up, what do you actually need? You know, and often I'd say, I don't actually need anything. But, you know, I, I could never, I felt I had to go along with whatever he said, but everything he bought was actually slightly, slightly different. And I think he got all his stuff from an Italian warehouse. Okay. You know, so everything was just slightly, you know, if I said cheese and hadn't bothered to say plain cheddar, <laughs> you'd get some, get a, you know, and, and I couldn't say, look, the chair was no good, I yeah. don't want, uh, anyway. <laughs> but I think as from now that everything's opening up, um, we don't, I think that he can sign himself off, we don't need yeah. to get the geriatric yeah. scrub. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can I be part of that? Will he de- deliver me cheese down in Glasgow? That'd be great. <laughs> I'd love that. Um... So yeah, like you've obviously had some pretty crazy adventures and some stuff that, as mere mortals, are just envious of. Uh, I think a lot of people sitting in that audience in Fort William were just in awe watching that film because it was really good. That film was amazing. Well, you know, um, I'm glad you say that because I honestly think it's boring, but especially that girl <laughs> with her kayak and and, it, and everything else. You know, it was just a yeah a plodding. But I, bet I mean, it wasn't... I never did anything that nobody did. You know, everything was anybody could have done, but, uh, but you people were... didn't like everybody was going to the Himalayas. Yeah, yeah. And you pay your money and you queue and everything, and nobody, but nobody was was going to Peru. Yeah, where you could just get the train to walking distance of the foothills. None of oh. this great, you know, it didn't didn't cost you anything. Yeah. Now I gather, actually, somebody said to me at one of the film things, I think it might have been them, that um, yeah. it's, they're catching up now. Yeah, they are. Money are. and you have to go through the... You know, so there still are yeah. unclimbed... Oh, you know, it's loads still to do. Loads to do. So, yeah, I've got some questions on, on the kind of stuff that was in the films, Peru and, and Greenland and stuff, but um, I've got some questions about kind of your journey into that. Because uh, that's one thing that the film didn't really get to touch on was kind of your background before that. Well, <laughs> because the people that made the film, and the only reason I really said I'd do it, because it's not really my scene, <laughs> um, was because we were... Hugh, my husband, Yeah. he he w- went for... He's always been interested in photography, and when he went off to work for FIDS, that was the Fort Island Dependency Service, which yeah. is now ba- Basque, they call it, in the Antarctic, they went for three years. And when everyone else was taking a box of brownie, he took a Leica camera. And his pictures, which are all around this house, except in this room perhaps. There's some amazing photos um, around the house. Are his pictures. And we'd oh, never wow. really had a exhibition or anything like that. And we were just going to. We were just sort of putting his film, his pictures. That's why there's so many of his pictures lying around. And we were going to have it in Aberfeldy, you know, the yeah. bookshop there. They were, Anyway, it was all going to happen. And then he got ill and one thing now, so we never have. Mm. So I thought with this film... Um, you know, that might do just Good opportunity to Hugh's to pictures. Either, yeah. And although they hardly ever mention it, um, that, that's, wow. that, those are his pictures, All and that pictures. really is unique. Most places, but not that day at the fort, most people say, you know, pictures are amazing. How, who, you know, how did you get the... For instance, the pictures, I think, and the, out there... Um, when we get the sail up and going against the ice and stuff, yeah. and most people say, well, you know, that's uh, touched my heart. I've never seen anything like that. But funny enough, at the fort, no, we didn't ever, I don't think the pictures were ever mentioned. I don't yeah. think, as far as I can remember. I don't think so. I don't think so. so. Because I said to Mike afterwards, why didn't you talk about you flipping pictures? That was the whole point of them. <laughs> uh, so most of your expeds, uh, the sort of, Big ones were 50s, 60s, was it? Around the 50s and 60s? The, the sort of Greenland we trips, through, the Peru um, trips. Well, we've always, I mean, we were in Greenland last year. Yeah. We've always 
so you, right, no, but I mean, from the sixties on, usually, you've done all these big ones. That, that, I mean, if you're talking about the film, the film yeah. really go, only goes into the crossing Greenland. I don't right. know quite why they got involved in that. And I was surprised that they wanted so much about um, the North Pole trip, which was a failure. Yeah, they don't usually want failures, but that's what they sort of. Uh, it was on. a good story. It was a good story. <laughs> well, the pic, you know, the pictures are good. Yeah, yeah. And we've been, you know, we were very lucky yeah. that nowadays, um, you know, with global warming and all the rest of it, it's quite a different story. Yeah. You can't just buy a ticket and <laughs> start walking. Yeah. So when you, the Peru trips and stuff, that was back in the in, in well, the fifties. And... Well, Peru was before I got married. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was born in 1930. The, this was know, back when there was, you know, there's not a lot of women doing big I was expeditions very lucky like this. I worked in the fort. Yeah. As a radiographer, that was a new, well, anyway. And Duff, the Duff stretcher, you know all about all yeah. that story. He was the, the only, actually, the doctor to the hospital. There was only okay. one. Now there must be about fifty, I suppose, at the fort. Yeah. Anyway, he was inventing a new his Duff stretcher. And the mountain rescue was just getting formed, and he was the first person with one of the GPs in the fort who said, what do people really need to know in the way of medicine? You know, first aid. Yeah. You don't want the, mount, the um, rescue party, you know, doing great horrors, making things, <laughs> you know, anything like that. Well, what do you really have? Anyway, they were putting all that together. And if it was a good day, he'd just close the hospital, and we'd go up the hill and try out his <laughs> new... <laughs> And anyway, because of that... I can't see them doing that these days. <laughs> the NHS would be up and murder them. But I was very lucky because, you know, the fort's like, a yeah. lot of people are climbing, but things like the SMC and so on didn't really... You know, it wasn't those sort of people. Yeah. But the local um, local climbers, a lot of them were Craig Drew, had come to work because they were just building, for instance, that great big hole that they dug Yeah. Um, for the water in Glen... Um, they, they more or less took the innards out of a hill, Monroe, and and in there they've got a big dam that was the beginning of all the electricity coming that way. Coming. Oh, I can't remember what it's called. I will. But in the, anyway, so the shipyard workers who were into climbing, yeah. Craig Do, were all getting jobs in the fort. So there was a nucleus of of climbers of new to really the fort who were climbers. really absolutely, you know, gobsmacked what yeah. there was. And they were all working. Suddenly there was work to be had there. I don't think there is now, and there certainly wasn't before then. Not on the same scale anyway. <laughs> there were jobs. So that's what they were doing. And these all these climbers, of course, were interested with Duff and his stretcher. And, yeah. and there were people like Hamish McInnes inventing his ice axes, for yeah. instance. All, all that sort of thing was happening. Yeah. And I was very lucky that because I was... With my boss Duff, um, they just sort of accepted me. Yeah. So I don't know whether you know Jimmy Ness. Do you know Jimmy yeah. Ness? Do you know him? Yeah. Well, he was a great. He was the sort of leader of that gang. Not that he was the best climber, but oh, he knew how to get to places and all that. His father was actually an engine driver and drove his engine, drove the train along that you know magic route from well from Glasgow. All the way up. up all the way yeah. up to the, to the fort. And after any, anything, we'd always go back and sit on the floor in his house and he'd tell us, oh, when the snow, you know, we had three, three weeks we were stuck and 20 <laughs> people on the train. He, he just had endless, it was just a sort of magic world. Yeah. And I was, you know, very lucky to be part of it. And there weren't any, the girlfriends didn't, they all had girlfriends, but they didn't want to do no, that. None of them went out. They didn't yeah. want to. You, like, you know, infiltrated the I, boys' club almost. Well, it, it was never mentioned because I was part of Duff. I mean, it wasn't that you, you can just imagine. No, part of the crew. Craig Dew would say. <laughs> <laughs> but it meant, you know, I went, we used to go to Jacksonville and yeah. it was just part of, you know, and I was lucky that everybody wanted, was interested in Duff and yeah. Hamish. And anyway, then Everest was climbed and so everybody was looking for something higher. And at that time... Um, the great thing was to go to emigrate to New Zealand. Right. Well, uh, they were called the, the the ten bob, the ten pound ponds, and all that climbing lot wanted to get higher. Yeah. So they realised that New Zealand was the place to go. To you know, they only very few of them had actually even been to the Alps, but they knew that for ten quid, they could get to New Zealand, where there were you know those 
loads health. of unclaimed health. Uncla- and so that, that was a great thing to do. And you could apply to the Mount Everest Fund right. and get cash. So not only could you get there for a tenner, but you could get cash. Someone to pay you to go exactly. out Exactly. You had to get a letter. Wow. And I was like, I actually knew Bill Murray. Not the actor. The... <laughs> anyway, you, you could apply for that for money. And so I got to know a guy called Bill Wallace. I don't know whether you... Anyway, Billy and I decided that you know, they, they were on... We all went to New Zealand together as a £10 pom. You had to have a job for three years. Right. I saw my contract through, but none of them did. <laughs> but there were the freezing works, which yeah. was also a new idea. So they all got work in the freezing works in the southern South Island. Right. I was there as a radiographer, which was my job as a... That's what I, what I, I was. So... For a weekend, you know, we could climb a Virgin Peak and then Darren or something like that. Yeah. Do you know? Have you been to New Zealand? I've never been to New Zealand. No, well, I really want to go. It's still, you know, it's not all that changed. And you'd think that the only climber in the whole of New Zealand was actually um, Hillary. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, don't say that. But there were guy, few others. Yeah. Virgin Peak. It's still the, the weekend. Same. All, yeah. all that. You know, it was. So you went out there for three years on a work contract, and every yes. weekend you were going out and bagging brand new hills. It was, it was, it, you know, it was just magic. And we were, we one of the reasons, of course, we could do everything was yeah. from climbing in Scotland. We knew how to cut steps, so right, we could yeah, make traverses. Course. And there's a, we did a new route on Mount Aspiring, which is the one of the hills to go. And people thought that was amazing, and, and it wasn't in the least. It was just that. You know, the great thing here, we didn't wear cramps. Cramps, crampons were... No. You didn't do that. <laughs> you just <laughs> never used them. But, of course, we had... We'd got um, nails on our yeah, boots. The, the... And with our long axes, the great thing was how many hits till you get a step. You know, and I've yeah. got small hands and small feet. So, so I you could, can cut I tiny could little steps. I could climb my steps mighty quickly. <laughs> and we, did a, we just did a traverse. Yeah. Easy. Wow. Uh, the face of things. Oh, my goodness, these Scots climbers. You, know? <laughs> you guys anyway, must have been seen as just crazy back mo- then. Exactly. Most of the others then, people like um, Tommy Tommy Paul and, well, Hamish McKinnis particularly, they all they all did go off to the Himalayas. Yeah, yeah. But I came back home because I got a mother and I was a wage earner, actually, for my family. Um, anyway, so I, I didn't do that, but I came yeah. back and then, you know, Billy and I... Um, you know, where can we we have to get do something more than just go to the Alps? So that's why we really planned um, to go to Peru. The Peru trips, yeah. And with Bill Murray writing the letter to the <laughs> Himalayan, whatever, um, we got our money. But we needed three people, and we tried all sorts of you know climbers at the time, but nobody yeah. actually wanted to come. But Hugh Simpson, who I'd already got to know. Um, he was in the Antarctic for yeah. three years. You had to sign up for three years there. And he just was just finishing that. And he'd been a great climber in his day. And since in the Antarctic, he'd got known for all his stuff he did there. Anyway, so we arranged for Hugh to get off the boat in Lima, in Peru. And we took us six weeks to sail down to Lima. And we all met in Peru. So then we had our three You had your three people, people. yeah. And, you know, it was just... Um, I was surprised that the film didn't actually wasn't all that keen on. I mean, some of the, they did take a bit of that Peru stuff. A little bit, yeah. But for instance, we we had a friend. There was a Scot working in a mine. Okay. And the mine in, in Peru. In Peru, right? And the mines, you know, are about fifteen thousand feet people live. Yeah. And they're actually working, you know, higher than that. Anyway, he was a geologist working for this mine, so he said, "Come and stay with him, and um, we could get used to that." Altitude, he'd lend us some horsey at horses yeah. and stuff. So we dosed down there and we spent a month getting acclimatized. Now, I've got a son who last summer climbed, you know, the um, Mustang Alta? Yes. Well, Bruce climbed it last summer oh, really? with his son. And they went out, they were there, I think, for two days <laughs> and then climbed to 22,000 feet. Yeah. And wondered why it didn't feel <laughs> well. <laughs> you know, I said, we took a month to get acclimatised. <laughs> How could you possibly do that? In two days. But, you know, that's what people go to Everest and yeah, that's what take a do, weekend yeah. off. You yeah. know, I mean, it's... 
It's nuts, and the it? medics are apparently are producing pills and stuff, and it can't be right. No. You know, discussing this with Evelyn, who I've said you didn't think the climbing walls were yeah. in, and I said, what about these people taking going to the Himalayas and taking pills, climbing 24,000 feet and coming down and say they've been... <laughs> I'm not feeling quite right. You know, yeah. and it's... I wonder I why. It's, and, and call that mountaineering. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we stayed with him. Yeah. And it was actually the first time he also had a kayak. First time I'd ever been in a kayak. And we put it in backwards, and we went down our first rapids of the um, the great big the Amazon backwards. And I've got a picture of that on the outside of a book downstairs. We, we couldn't understand how people said, you know, paddle like that. Yeah. Because here we were going backwards down the rapids, and we wanted. To... <laughs> anyway, it was it was of course just magic, and we learned a yeah. bit about the people and so Excellent. on. And then eventually, you can get a bus, and then you pick up a, a donkey and a donkey man and shovel yeah. your luggage on it and you walk to your hills. That's all, all you have to do. None of this flying into the... Flying right to the base. All and, that stuff. Yeah. Just, so how long were you in Peru for? Um, three months. Three months. And you spent a month of that just acclimatising... Well, and we, you know, we didn't speak Spanish. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we sort of... Yeah. Just exploring, really, just, and finding yeah. out what it was. Experiencing for. the place. To get our money... Um, you have to say what you're going to do. Yeah. And we'd seen there was a French expedition that had just come back, and um, magic, magic hills. Uh, and there was a picture of this, so that's the yeah. only name we knew. We said, "Oh, we'll climb that." So of course, then we we had to find <laughs> find them, climb the blinking thing. <laughs> and it, and it was. Um, Did you get it done? We got it got it oh, done. Nice. Yes. Yeah. And so then you know we knew a bit about where the hills were and what yeah, we wanted yeah. to do and. <clears throat> and so on. But Hugh, meanwhile, was working on his... He's a pathologist. Thing. Did we talk about that? Anyway, his research... He was very lucky that the work he was doing was just at the time when NASA, yeah. the American setup, was one, was thinking about going to the moon. And it just so happened that Hugh's research that he was doing in the Antarctic was exactly what they wanted. How would man exist on a different length of day, you know. Right, yeah. You know how bodies, it spits out hormones and all the rest of it at different... Yeah, it's going to mess with your and rhythm. It, and all of that stuff. How, how would their scientists getting them there, what would happen then? And it just so happened, when Hugh just sort of said what his research was, they'd given money to do it. So actually a bit of that three months was us being guinea pigs to Hugh's research. And he right. took blood samples at different <laughs> times of the, of the day and yeah. stuff. So we went to this area where the mining happens. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people would catch us fish and give them to us and all that sort of sort of stuff. So we knew what we were on about because, well, I'm sure you know this, but if you think about Peru, it's not the snow and ice is not as you find it anywhere else in the Himalayas or the Alps or anything, because you know it's that great ribbon of mountains yeah. with the the Amazon on one side, hot, hot, hot stuff with huge winds coming up and they sort of go up like that and then crash down on the other side, which is quite close to the Pacific. Yeah. So the snow melts and so you're left with these little pinnacles. And anyone that's climbing in Peru writes about, you know, you, you climb, you, you find out very quickly and put your foot behind this. So there's a staircase, fantastic. And then you get to about the hundred the fifth and fifth up, and you think, "Oh, I can nearly see the ridge." When the whole thing goes dung dung dung, oh. and you're right down at the bottom. It's you know you have to get used to that. Yeah, That's and so stuff. suddenly, um, you know, knowing about cutting steps and it, it comes and so it comes, comes in, handy, it all it? comes in handy again. Yeah. And we got, you know we got used to this, but the only people we ever met in all those three months who were into climbing was a French party. Right. And they're just two young guys on their own. And they'd been got mixed up in a terrific storms and all the labels had come off their food. Right. But they were just about to go home. And they said, you can have all this stuff, but we don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and being French, the first tin we opened, it was revolting looking things. And of course, they were, sea they were um, snails. Oh, no. <laughs> and they had legs, frogs, you know. Oh, all... <laughs> anyway... It was only through this film that I've ever contacted those guys again. And right. an old man came up when we were doing the New York thing and said, um, 
do, do, you, do you remember meeting two French guys and we had a meal in the tent and, and it all came floating back to me? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I mean, it was, it was just funny because we hadn't, yeah. you know, we were absolutely on a shoestring living off, you know, fish we could catch or things like that at lower yeah. levels. And so we were delighted to get there. These tins. Ten, tins of snails. No, but some of them were magic, but we had no... I never knew what we were having for supper. It was a fantastic... And mystery dinners. Mystery dinners. Mystery dinners. That's part of the adventure, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, of course it was. Yeah. So how many um, sorry. peaks did you climb in Peru then? Oh, something like 22. I can't remember offhand, but wow. because of that film, we did very carefully yeah. get how many <laughs> and what altitude. I can give you that list of... I can't really remember. Yeah. Big um, list. What though. it was. But we... The, the, peak, the peak we wanted to climb was 21 thou, so we did that, and mostly, you know, that was most of the sort of altitude, but yeah. at the end of our trip, we still had some days left, and wherever we went, we saw in the distance, it's like seeing Nevis, yeah. and you think, How, have to climb Nevis. Anyway, it was the the highest peak. Is that the uh, Waskaran? Waskaran. Yeah. Now, it's been climbed, funnily enough, the first climb was by a woman. Right. Coming in from the northern, it, it's not all that difficult. Annie S. Peck, she was called. Yeah. Anyway, she climbed it in the 1890s. In the 1890s? Yeah. You know how there were... Wow. There were Victorian women that... They were just great. They got plants. Most of the... If you hear, you know, if you look up who, yeah. brought, who brought the first... Um, you know, whatever it was, rhododendron in or something yeah, like yeah. that. It would be these Victorian botanists. Yeah, it was okay to be a botanist. You were allowed things, yeah. to do that. You know, that was wasn't beyond the pale. And anyway, she climbed. She climbed the first peak, American woman. Anyway, but there were, nobody had climbed from the other. We were short of time. Yeah, there had been an American expedition in that very year with something like twenty porters and all that sort of stuff. Wow. And, and there were just the three of us. And, Anyway, anyway, so of course we had to find something that was quick, <laughs> quick enough. So we climbed it from the from another yeah. side. But there are lots of pictures of it downstairs. We can. Oh, I'd love to look. Can you put some of them. that into that or? Uh, I can or do you want definitely to take. See, or, I mean, well, I can, whatever you want. We'll have a look at them later yeah, after, okay. the, after the recording. Anyway, so we did climb. We had this American party who'd done the lower bit the same as us yeah. and then we ran out of time and anyway we did did that summit so that was our highest peak which was 24 yeah thou. and anyway there's a picture in the kitchen and I'm struggling at the last tent and you think what the devil I'm doing I was trying to get my cramps off and couldn't <laughs> and we slept we had one sleeping bag for the three of us yeah and, and then the boys <laughs> I had to sleep with me with my crampons on. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't kicking them in the middle of the night, were you? <laughs> I don't know. Any, no, we didn't. We were all... You know, people say you can't sleep high, but we were so well, so well accustomed. I mean, yeah. I hear Bruce said that he never slept a wink climbing this mustache at a... Yeah. Well, we swept and slept all right because yeah. we were, A month of acclimatisation, yeah, you're exactly. ready for it, yeah. But we didn't... I mean, the so... It, it's just so fantastic to go to Peru because if we'd gone down the way we'd come up, we could just have got the bus to the boat. And yeah. But we had about oh, a couple of days left and none of us uh, had been into the Amazon or anything like that. So we actually came out the other side and down, down and made our way. And we had the, yes, into the Amazon. Oh, wow. And we had the address of a Greenock, um guy that imported wood yeah and somebody told me before we'd left home oh if you're ever in the amazon you know this this guy's useful because he cuts his trees or did mm. teak and i don't think they're they export teak no. anyway That's he cut right. his trees and made rafts and took it all the way down the amazon back to Greenock. so we thought that sounds an interesting guy anyway so we did just that we took that up and met the guy he told us how to get a lorry to just the banks of the mm. And we thought, but we'd been on the Amazon when we started off our first... <laughs> anyway, it, you know, it was just magic. So we had a few days on his raft making our way out. But we actually did, because yeah. we got our boat tickets, we had to get back. We got, you can get lorries and stuff, you know, you can yeah, do all that. On the time pressure, I mean, you have to do get a, back. Yeah, yeah. We, and, it, you know, it's all doable in Peru. Yeah. You know, there are mines and there's... It's amazing. Boats it go, you know, I mean, it's... Um, 
as I'm sure it used to be, but yeah. in Nepal. But nowadays, what was it like planning for trips to Peru or New Zealand or that back in back in the fifties? Like when people well, aren't when people aren't going out to Peru, knowing if they, if they go to Peru in our day, yeah. there, there were absolutely no maps. Yeah, but quite a few. Well, French, but all those early peaks. I mean, I'm talking now about the. I got married in 1960. I'm talking about 56, yeah. the late 50s. There were very, very few maps you could buy. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and, and where on earth do you get a map from, from there anyways? Nowadays, I'm sure you get them on, on your mobile. Oh, you can find it on the phone, yeah. Anyway, so, the, you know, you couldn't pour over maps. Yeah, big unknowns. Yeah, that was what, what I find. I mean, that's what I find it. Exciting, yeah. You know that's why I said the German word wanderlust, yeah, one wanderlust or whatever they say. We don't have that word. No, <laughs> we've forgotten about that. You know, the whole. But, I mean, I didn't get get into climbing. Oh, you know, people say to me, "Oh, the first woman or something." It never occurred to me. Yeah, it was just a happy I just went because I like I wanted to go there, and I felt that well, as I say, Peru was cheap. Yeah. Billy and I went on a, a Spanish boat. It took six weeks to get there, but it cost next to nothing because Spain was getting it. Well, Britain was doing its ten-pound palms. Right. Spain was also sending out um, boats to South America with you know people getting some land. Yeah, and yeah. Getting you know, they were absolutely avid for getting out there the way the Brits were. To, to get to Australia. Yeah. I think it was all because, well, particularly from the West Coast, because we sailed down the Clyde, and it was just lined with people, pipers up every... It, it was just incredible, because it was so many people had come back from the war. Yeah. Desperate for some land and some future, and they hadn't actually started building the new towns. Back to, you know, mum and dad's old tenement, no lav- indoor lavatory or sharing it between... Yeah. Kids were happy playing in the streets, but the, anyway, you know, the dads back from the war realised there was more to life than that. So people just couldn't get enough, enough uh, yeah, wanting if, to go to Australia and New Zealand. I don't think New Zealand was as popular, but all all those um, all those people from the shipyards and so on, they were just yeah. avid to, to go there. So that's who was, our boats were filled with. But the same thing was happening in Europe. Yeah. You know, the, Europe was in chaos. People don't know, you know, they just don't think about that now. You know, Britain was on its knees. There was no money. There was sweetie rationing well into the 50s. Yeah. And when I went out to New Zealand, first thing we did was buy a bar of chocolate and we sat down <laughs> in a row on the dock side and ate it. Each of us had a bar of chocolate. I mean, that was... <laughs> the little things in life, that, isn't it? That was 53 when I went to New Zealand. But, you know, we just... Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the boys that were really did it who wanted to go on immediately onto the Himalayas, of course, they were, you know, what did the New Zealanders, what did, how did Hillary, what did he eat, and yeah. how did he get those boring old um, Alpine Club people, um, you know, <laughs> what happened? Anyway, they were desperate to be part of that, and of course, avid, very competent climbers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think Hamish McInnes ever bought any food all the time he was in New Zealand. He just moved from camp to camp. <laughs> scrounging. Uh, uh, scrounging, yes, <laughs> and got their eye on what they wanted. Yeah. And, and that's, of course, their aim was was to climb Everest and that all the equipment and stuff had all been abandoned. Yeah. So they reckoned they'd soon be climbing K2 and the other mouth-watering tops. Oh, all the big, as a lot of them all the big did. scary ones. <laughs> if, oh, how did it, we get that? Well, yeah. we couldn't get... We, well, what sparked me up anyway was this book I got hold of in, in the library in Edinburgh of this French climbing party with this magnificent peak on the outside, a typical Peruvian narrow yeah. peak. It was just absolutely magnificent. Um, and I said to Billy, you know, let's, that's what we want to do. So that that's how we got that's involved with Peru. Came from. Yeah. And then when we found that you know, we asked lots, quite a few people who still said, oh, you know, you asked us to go to Peru and we said we couldn't, we'd just got a job or they'd just got 
whatever. Yeah, yeah. We've got the degree, or we can't drop it now. So, Hugh, <laughs> that's how Hugh came with us. Yeah. Lots of people who we asked didn't. But when we got there, we soon sort of found out that, for instance, Waras was the sort of Kathmandu of the Himalaya, of, of Peru. Yeah. He had to get to Waras. And there there was a priest who, for some reason or other, was inter- very interested in mountaineering, and he had become the sort of diarist of that. He knew exactly who had, who had been done out, what, who had and... climbed what, and there were lists of... Right. Um, so there was a sort of organ- organisation. So you could find some, some well, stuff Well, we out. found him and found out who had climbed, what wasn't climbed. We were only interested in yeah. who hadn't climbed. <laughs> and every valley had mouth-watering oh, yeah. peaks, and, you know, you could... You could, well, we knew that we hoped, well, we hoped anyway, um, to get a donkey and, yeah. and a man and been told that. So we'd gone to the barrows at the time where you could just buy any amount of ex-army equipment. So we didn't go to the equivalent of Taiso. We went to the barrows where the ex-army stuff was. Right. And we'd taken extra balaclavas and stuff for our porters. In the end, we had one guy... <clears throat> taking his donkey, we hired him, and he didn't come onto the snow, but he'd take our stuff so far, and at the end of three months, he still didn't know how to put the balaclava on, so that the face bit was in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Maximo, he was called. Maximo. Maximo. That's I've got great. lovely slides of him, and he'd, he'd take us to his grannies or things like yeah. that, and they lived in hay houses. Um, wow. And they made their money actually out of breeding bulls for the bullfighting. Right. The sort of higher alpine area they lived there, and they made their houses out of really just out of high growing grasses. Yeah. And they lived off guinea pigs, which just ran wild and lived. So lived if, they'd, off if they pigs. implied that you wanted a meal, first catch a guinea pig, and it would just go zooming through. You just <laughs> catch it. And they. They love the skin, all their hats and some yeah. lovely textiles and so on they have. And that's, a lot of it is guinea pig. If any of my kids are actually going to listen to this and they own a <laughs> guinea pig, they're going to be sitting here in tears now. Yes, <laughs> guinea pigs make really nice meat. Yes, <laughs> like squirrels. <laughs> a little bit easier to catch than squirrels. Anyway, you know, they look completely look after themselves. And yeah. there's a million trillion kind of, of them in those there, high alpine pastures. Yeah. Yeah. And the men are working in the mines, so the women catch the guinea pigs and stuff. It's not like, you know, the Alps where they're looking after cows and stuff like that. It's, yeah. it's mining, mining, and the men are nearly all sloshed all the time <laughs> because they're chewing this cocoa. Oh, right, um, yeah. So they which apparently makes them able to... Anyway, Billy, Billy immediately said, oh, I'll have some of that. I'll try it out. I had a... You know, I didn't like the like the stuff, so I yeah. spat it out. But Billy ate it and helped, said it was helps with the altitude. We're supposed it? to, and that's yeah. how they can work them. They said yeah. they can't otherwise. But if you go into a village or something, the men will all be sloshed out, lying on the pavement, and you think, "What's he sleeping? You know, he must be a miner on a late shift or something." Yeah. No, he's just absolutely sloshed. He's just had too the, too much chewing the cocoa. Needed a siesta. And, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so what sort of equipment did you? Oh, from the barrels, it, it was all ex-army. All ex-army stuff. It could well, have been I mean, that when, much stuff if you managed to fit it on one back, donkey. You know, Spike, who we were talking about, yeah. Spike came back from the Antarctic at the same time, well, he was a bit later than Hugh. The reason he started his shop... Um, Never Sports. Never sport, yeah. sport was because he couldn't buy carabiners in Fort William. Right. But so none. He, thought, he thought that was out ridiculous. I'll, have, I'll start a shop. So he started that shop, yeah. Never Sport. <clears throat> and out of that came his great. That was well. There weren't shops. Yeah. That's why we couldn't buy them. Right. But there was masses of ex, ex army equipment. Never all every skier in the early days of Scottish skiing. All they ex-army all wore ex army. And so you laugh like a drain when your grandchildren say, "Oh, they need a new jacket, an anorak, you know, and it'll cost three hundred pounds." And they only got one. The last one is very old, two yeah. years ago. We wore ex army stuff. That was good enough for. Skiing in Glencoe in those days, every everybody did that. Yeah, and you bought your skis for ten pounds, but you could that was ex army. But if they had white paint on them, it was fifteen quid. Right, and everybody skied on ex army stuff. It was only you know after a bit of skiing there that the 
well, they were mostly Craig Do or yeah. the various climbing clubs who took on to the skiing in Glencoe. They said, why is it that the French can win our races? Why, there must be a better way of doing this and a better way of making skis. And that's what really started, you know, skiing in Scotland. Yeah. Bill Haber started a factory in Aviemore. You could buy real skis, <laughs> not just ex-army stuff that bounced as you yeah. went along. And, of course, the, the climbing shops and so on began to sprout out and ski gear and well you know the you know the outcome of it. in fact my daughter I didn't because of this cut down it was her birthday and I hadn't given her a prezi yeah and I thought oh and she said they needed a new tent family tent I wrote her a check which I reckon buy you the best possible tent I really looked at the check and said oh mum that will buy a bit of it and I said, what, you want... Only... <laughs> Mum, Matt, don't you know the price of a tent? They're at least £300. Oh, and yeah. I said... <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we went to Greenland with sort of 25 quid. Well, actually, Hugh brought it back from the Antarctic. Yeah. So we took that tent. That was the tent we took on our first trip to Greenland. See, I told you she was a legend. You'll find part two is already live, so go click that link and listen to us chat polar exploration in the next part. Uh, And remember, if you're going out and climbing in between this, do your buddy checks.